King James Version. Whose Bible is this? Did he claim it? It's a prop for BBS. Well, there you go. Mystery solved. All right, today we are continuing in our study of 1 Peter. And so if you have a Bible, please take it and find 1 Peter. It's in the latter part of your New Testament. If you don't have a Bible that you want to follow along, you can probably find one underneath the row of chairs in front of you. We're going to look together at verses 20 and 21 of uh, chapter 1. And uh, I think that this passage of Scripture is surprisingly wonderful. That's my first observation after studying it. It really is a passage of Scripture that gives us the the plan of salvation, but really the drama of redemption. Going back into eternity past, through Christ coming into this world, through the purposes and plans that he has for us, it really is all here in five different points that uh, I want to draw from these two verses. Let's step back from the text for just a moment and remind you that 1 Peter chapter 1 is a chapter that is pretty evenly divided between the indicative and the imperative. If that's confusing, let me explain. Uh, the indicative is the voice of reality. And the first half of 1 Peter is in the indicative. In other words, what is it that God has done for us through Christ? All of the great spiritual blessings that are ours because of Christ. Peter really, like a fountain, pours forth these blessings that come to us through Christ in the first half of this chapter. And then in the second half, all of a sudden we have the appearance of a number of imperatives. The imperative is the voice of command. And so clearly we have a telling of the gospel and then a calling us to respond to the gospel. The gospel is first. God saves us. He does that first. But then we are called to respond to his saving work in various ways. And so by way of review, let me just mention some of these imperatives. There are more actually in most of your English translations than there are in the Greek text. But here are some of these. Verse 13, set your hope. And the context there is set your hope on future grace. That's a Piper phrase. Set your hope on the future grace of God. Set your hope on glory. And it really contrasts with a statement in verse 6 that we considered some time ago. A little while. We face trials in this world for a little while. But in context, in verse 6, the little while might be your whole life in this world. You're 70 years in this life. But it's a little while in contrast to the glory that will someday be yours. And so, in response to the gospel, we are commanded to set our hope on God's future grace. And then verse 14, do not be conformed. We are called to non-conformity with this world. And what a challenge that is. And it is increasingly a challenge in this culture. And by the way, the statistics that I sometimes come across are not all that encouraging. 
Statistically speaking, so many professed Christians are not living in a way that distances them from the lifestyle of those in this world. We're called to nonconformity, but in so many ways, it seems like the pressure of this culture is conforming us to its pattern. Verse 15, be holy. Gird up the loins of your mind. Remember that text? And pursue holiness. Christians are called to be a distinct, a holy, or a set-apart people. The word holy, both the Hebrew word and the Greek word, literally, the words mean to be set apart. When Moses encountered God in the burning bush at Mount Sinai, you heard the passage, you're standing on holy ground. Take off your sandals. You're on holy ground. You're on set apart ground. Because God is in this place. Verse 17, conduct yourself with fear. So Christians are to have a loving reverence for God. God being first in our lives. And then verse 22, we haven't got to this verse yet, but it's the final of these imperatives. Love one another earnestly. So love for God, the vertical relationship, but the reality, to use one of the key phrases in 1 Peter in the opening verses, we are elect exiles living in this world, a world that in many ways is hostile to us, and increasingly so, and we need one another. At least once a week to come into a room like this and find that you are the majority. You are surrounded by fellow believers who are as weird as you are. <laughs> serving a God that the world finds exceedingly strange and hard to understand and relate to. So we are called to love one another earnestly. And it's in the midst of these commands, these imperatives, that we find these two verses that we're going to look at together today. And again, I've entitled this sermon, God's Eternal Saving Plan in Christ. Verse 20. He... Christ was foreknown before the foundation of the world. That's the first thought. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world. The second thought, he was made manifest, brought into this world in the last times for the sake of us. The third thought, who through him, a little preposition, the preposition dia, translated through, used 600 times in the New Testament, a very common little word. But it's a reminder to us that we connect to God through Christ. So the uniqueness of Christ, it's through him that we are believers in God. The forethought, the glory of this Christ, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory. You see, there's a trajectory in the life of Christ from high to low to high. God from eternity past made manifest, coming into this world, making himself nothing, suffering on the cross for his people. But now, raised from the dead, given glory. And then fifthly, that your faith and hope are in God. I don't know where you find yourself this morning, but I want to say to you with absolute confidence, there is hope to be found, and that hope is in God. Christ. 
So we rejoice in that hope this morning. So five thoughts. And I want to go back to verse 20 to this opening phrase and just walk with you through these five thoughts that in their totality really do give us God's saving purposes in the person and work of Christ. So it opens this way. He, Christ, was foreknown before the foundation of the world. Now, the Greek word that is translated by my Bible as foreknown is the word prognosko. Gnosko means to know. Diagnosis comes from this Greek word. If you go to a doctor, you want a diagnosis, don't you? You might not like the diagnosis, but ultimately, Getting a diagnosis is worse than the doctor saying, you're having major problems. Your heart's not wanting to work right. You're having seizures every 30 minutes. We have no idea why. You want a diagnosis. So prognosco, this root means to know or to bring into the know. And the prefix pro, as you probably know, means before. So to know something beforehand. Now, this is an interesting word in Greek, and I can show you how interesting it is primarily by simply reading to you various English translations of this statement. Because our various English translations do not render this word precisely the same way and what that is telling us is that this word has, within various contexts, a significant range of meaning. By the way, this is a bit of an aside, but not much of an aside. It is this very same word that comes into the Old Testament in a number of passages, such as one representative one. Abraham knew his wife. Sarah. Now we understand what that means, don't we? It doesn't mean simply that Abraham knew her name and knew her birthday or what her favorite flower or color was. No, it is speaking of an intimacy of knowing. And so whenever you encounter this word in the Bible, that thought should be somewhere in your mind and so sometimes this word can be translated this way, for loving. God for loving Christ, or God for loving a people. But here are some other renderings. Again, first the ESV, which I'm using this morning, just for known before the foundation of the world. The NIV, I think in all of its iterations, and there are different Translations are living kind of documents, and sometimes there are updates to them. The NIV that I tend to reference is an older version, but I think that the newer ones do it the same way. You can correct me if I'm wrong on this. Translates as follows. He was chosen before the creation of the world. Is that right in the NIV? Right, that's right. That's an excellent translation. Because this word really does have about it this, this sense of God placing his love on an individual, but doing so in a sovereign, calling kind of way. The King James, going all the way back to the year 1611, says this, who was foreordained before the foundation of the world. There's at least one English translation that I encountered this week that renders this way. He was predestined before creation. And so this word reminds us that Jesus was foreknown. Jesus was chosen. Jesus was sovereignly selected by God before creation. 
Before Genesis chapter 3, before the need of redemption, he was chosen by God to accomplish the plan of redemption. In other words, there is no plan B in the purposes of God. God is never caught off guard. God is never up in heaven wondering, well, I hope they don't mess up the whole plan. Now, that's our experience, right? I have five kids. I understand about kids messing up the plan or just basically in some ways messing up your life. Although I would give nothing in exchange for my five kids and the great joy that they have brought to me. But I'm not sovereign. And my plans and purposes are often frustrated. But a verse like this is reminding us that before sin, before fall, before brokenness, before 20-year-old shooters tried to assassinate presidential candidates, God sovereignly had chosen Christ to bring about the redemption of his people. Now, a way of summarizing this that I think is helpful if it can get inside your mind, I would state it this way, God's foreknowledge is not only cognitive, it is also causative. You see the difference there? It's not just simply that God, in eternity past, knew that Christ would come into the world and work a redemption for us. It is rather that God, in eternity past, chose Christ to come into the world and to make a redemption for His people. And the emphasis, at least in this text, is on the choosing of God the Father, which helps to insulate us from a distortion that sometimes people fall into. And the distortion is stated this way, Jesus is very good, Jesus is very kind, Jesus is willing to go to the cross to satisfy the wrath of of an offended father, and indeed, he is offended by sin. But we can present that as Jesus is merciful, and the Father is only just. Whereas a verse like this, and John 3.16, and 1 John 4.10, this is love, not that we love God, the Father, but that He loved us and sent His Son, or He gave His Son. And the Son was not coerced. The Son, out of love, willingly comes. But a verse like this reminds us that within the Trinity itself, there is this perfect unity, this perfect plan, and the Father, out of love for us, sends His Son. And His Son, out of love for us, comes. And the Holy Spirit, out of love for us, applies this work of redemption to our hearts. Way back in eternity past, this is the revealed purpose and plan of God. And it's good, isn't it? Yes. Now here's a shocker for you. At least it might come as a shock to some of you. We have already <coughs> encountered this word, prognosco, in 1 Peter. I don't know if you're aware of this, but it's way back in chapter 1, 
and verse 2. Let's read a bit of this to you again. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, verse 1, to those who are elect exiles. You're exiles in this world. You're in the wilderness wandering of this world. You're like the children of Israel. God with a mighty hand has redeemed you from slavery. And he's brought you into this wilderness world and you are making your way to the promised land. But right now you're exiles. Beloved by God, not so much by the world. But you're elect exiles. You're the elect of God. And then verse 2. According to the foreknowledge, the prognosco of God the Father. And I would simply submit to you that that word, prognosco, translated foreknowledge, or translated chosen, or translated as foreordained, or translated as predestined, has the same meaning in both of those passages in the context of 1 Peter chapter 1. And the significance of that, this is a very much a reformed leaning observation, if that makes sense to you, is not only has God sovereignly chosen Christ to make a redemption, but he has equally chosen us to be the recipients of that redemption. Because you cannot honestly say that the verse means one thing in chapter 2 and something entirely different. I'm sorry. The word... I said chapter 2, didn't I? What did I say? Let me just erase that. You cannot say that it means one thing in verse 2 and something entirely different in verse 20. In both verses, the emphasis is on the loving, sovereign, redeeming, calling word of God the Father. To call a son to make a redemption and to call a people to be the recipients of that redemption. Now after I studied this passage last week, I have a commentary on my on my shelves. Most of my commentaries are on my computer these days. But I had a commentary. It was a cast-off commentary years ago. Dick Yoder thought, don't need this commentary. I'm just going to throw it away. And I saw it in a box of Dick's throwaway books. I might be distorting the story slightly, but I don't think I am. He was discarding them. And it's a one-volume commentary from John MacArthur. John MacArthur is pretty black and white. He calls a spade a spade. And I pulled that commentary off and I thought, I wonder what MacArthur says about these verses. And I want to just read to you his comments. I agree with these comments. He writes, Christians are foreknown for salvation in the same way Christ was foreordained before the foundation of the world to be a sacrifice for sin. Acts 2.23. Foreknowledge means that God planned before, not that he observed before. Thus God pre-thought and predetermined or predestined each Christian's salvation. How do you respond to that? Well, before we split the church, because Christians have been splitting on this issue for, well, at least as far back as Augustine in the 4th century, and I would say all the way back to the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans, let me remind you, as I have in the past, that this teaching is not in the Bible for the purpose of causing Christian denominational splits. 
This truth is in the Bible to speak to people who are the outcasts of their society. This truth is in the Bible as it is in 1 Peter to say to us, particularly to the original audience, but who knows, 20 years down the road, where we will find ourselves in this culture. Christian, the culture might despise you. Christian, the culture might say, you are a zero. Christian, the culture might say, we have no tolerance for you. We have no love for you. We have no appreciation for you. Christian, there is a God in heaven who in love predestined you to adoption as son. Christian, the culture might cast you out, but God through Christ is welcoming you in. He is calling you. He's like the hound of heaven. He has placed his affection upon you. And the rest of it, frankly, let's simply live with the mystery of this truth. But rejoice in the security of our salvation. And to know that if you're here today in Christ, that God foresaw you, chose you, placed His love upon you before the foundation of the world. If God is for you in this way, well, the whole world can be against you. And I will endure so those are some opening thoughts from a profoundly rich and beautiful opening verse. He was, Christ was foreknown before the foundation of the world. But now we come forward in God's redemptive purposes and plans and we read these words, but he was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you. Now, what doctrine is this a reference to? What do we call this doctrine? I heard it. Who said it? The Incarnation. Is that artist? This is the Incarnation. This is Christ actually coming into the world. This is Christ being born to the Virgin Mary. I thought about talk, talking about the Annunciation type scene at this point, but I do not have time to do that. A beautiful way in which we can see this this plan of God sketched out for us in the Old Testament and how Jesus is the fulfillment of all of that. But for right now, just to make this simple observation that Christ came into this world sent by the Father to love us, to redeem us, to die for us, to go to the cross for us, to save us from our sins. And he did this, did this, if you will, in the fullness of time. When the time was right. This is God unfolding his plan. This is God accomplishing redemption for us. He was made manifest in the last times. A statement that reminds us that we are living in the last times. Really, the last times. It's the time between the first and the second advent. Within the plans and the purposes of God. We do not know when the end will come. We do not want to be date setters. When I was in college, there was a book that just went like a plague through the campus. 88 reasons why Jesus will return in 88. Now that dates me, doesn't it? And he did not return. And the next year, the author revised the book. 89 reasons why Christ will come in 89. We know that Christ will come when God determines that it is time for Christ to come the second time. Because if this text teaches us anything, it teaches us that this is God's plan. This is God's story. 
God is at the center of this. But he knows us, he loves us, he cares for us. And so Jesus was made manifest in these last times for the sake of you, for the sake of me, for us. And then the third observation, who through him are believers in God. Are you a believer in God this morning? Sam, are you a believer in God this morning? Am I putting you on the spot here? <laughs> are you trusting in Christ alone for your salvation? You know, if that first doctrine was difficult and controversial in our culture, how do we recognize that this one is also? To actually say in the 21st century that Jesus Christ is the unique mediator between God and man. The Bible says that, though, doesn't it? This preposition has a variety of different meanings that can be translated as through, or by, or because. It's really saying that Jesus is the conduit by which we are able to connect to God. Jesus is the one who bridges the gap between God and us. Jesus is the bridge that we are able to walk across in order to connect to God. Or perhaps better yet, Jesus is the bridge that God the Father comes across in order to connect to us. As the Apostle Paul says elsewhere, for there is one God, there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. But I want you to back up just for a moment and to really ponder these words at the end of verse 20. For the sake of sake of you, that this whole plan and purpose of God is for our sake. It's to save people like us. Go back, if you will, to Romans chapter 5. I'll just read you a couple of verses from Romans chapter, Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 6. Romans chapter 5 and verse 6. The Apostle Paul writes, For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for wonderful people like us. Is that what your Bible says? At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Back in chapter 4 and verse 5, we read that he justifies the ungodly. We don't clean ourselves up. We don't make ourselves acceptable. We don't have righteousness within us at a level that God says, Wow, I'm impressed. He or she is really righteous. Therefore, I declare you just. No, the text says God justifies the ungodly. He justifies us while we are ungodly. And then he begins a process of making us godly. While we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For the Bible says that any person who comes to Christ will not be cast off. If you're here today, and you're not a Christian, and God is speaking to your heart, and you know one thing to be true of you, you're ungodly. Well, guess what? Is not this verse saying to you, there is great hope in your situation? Because this God saves the ungodly while they are still ungodly. 
For one will scarcely die for a righteous person. Who would you be willing to die for? It's interesting, in that video yesterday of the attempted assassination of President Trump, there were at least two people. One was a woman, a young woman. Really young, actually. I don't know if her language quite reaches the gravitas of the situation, but she said something that I think is actually pretty significant. She said, the shots were fired, my boyfriend grabbed me, threw me down, threw his body on top of me, and then she said, you know, that was pretty cool. <laughs> you ought to marry that guy. And then the mayor of the little community was talking about how his wife is a police officer. And he said when the shots rang out, they were on the stage, and he grabbed his wife, the police officer, threw her down, and covered her with his body. That seems masculine, doesn't it? I mean, the men went down with the Titanic. So I don't know who you'd be willing to die for. Would you die for your wife? Do you die for her every day? Because that's the joke, right? Yeah, I'd die for her someday, but if we're rude and necessary, I don't really ask me to die for her every day. Would you die for your kids? I suspect there's a lot of men in this room, and women too, who would die for their kids. Would you die for a wretch? Would you die for an enemy? Would you die for the person who, when you're just driving down the road, and I don't know, you make some small driving here, and you hear that horn behind you, and you, you look in your rear view mirror, and the middle finger's up, and they're cursing you? God shows his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For us. That's the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Peter is saying the very same thing. That God brought Christ into the world. That Christ was made manifest in these last times for the sake of you who through Him are believers in God. It reminds me of a story I've told a number of times over the years, but the conversion of Charles Spurgeon. You don't know who Spurgeon was. Spurgeon has a lot of nicknames. He comes from the UK. He was living in the Victorian age. He died in 1892. He was in his early 50s. He died young. But one of his titles or labels is the Prince of Preachers. And Spurgeon is generally thought of as the most powerful preacher in the history of the English language. The story of his conversion. He was walking, I believe in the city of London, on an early Sunday morning, maybe shouldn't have been out, it was a blizzard. As he's walking along, he realizes that he cannot continue to go forward. The weather is far too extreme. And on the left or on the right, he saw a little building and a doorway, and he stepped into it. He found himself in what was then known as a primitive Methodist Church. And the preacher that Sunday was absent because the preacher couldn't get to church because of the blizzard. Maybe he had more sense than the teenager Charles Spurgeon. So Spurgeon came in with a handful of people in this little chapel and he sat down and a lay person came up to deliver the sermon. And Spurgeon said afterwards, he wasn't very good. He was certainly not eloquent. I believe he preached from the book of Isaiah. I don't have the exact text. But I remember these words. At one point in the sermon, this lay minister looked at the young teenager, Charles Spurgeon, maybe 17, 18 years of age, maybe 19. And he said, young man, 
You look miserable. Come to Christ. Come now. And Spurgeon was miserable. And Spurgeon came to Christ. And Spurgeon was saved. He experienced the unmerited favor of God. A God who saves the ungodly. And God is still doing that today. And it's through Christ. Christ is the unique mediator. And then finally, verse 21, through him we are believers in God. We come to this statement. The same God who raised Jesus from the dead and gave him glory. And you know what that is? That's a statement of the sovereignty of Christ, of the kingship of Christ. We think about his incarnation, his coming into this world, then of course he went to the cross, then he experienced resurrection, ascension into heaven, and then there's a doctrinal truth that we tend to not emphasize very much, what is called the session of Christ. That Jesus today rules as King of Kings and as Lord of Lords. That's interesting, isn't it? Where we find ourselves as a nation this morning. What if that assassin's bullet had just been slightly more accurate? What if instead of clipping Trump's ear, it got him in the eye? He'd be dead. What would the nation be doing today? It's hard to say, isn't it? I mean, I'd like to say conservatives don't riot and build, burn down buildings quite the way that progressives do. And then on the other hand, we have a president, President Biden, who in recent weeks has been revealed what's really been apparent for a much greater period of time, that he's in cognitive decline. And so he really does ask the question, I don't want to be overly political this morning, and I don't think I'm a political preacher, but you do ask the question, well, who is exactly in charge at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue? I mean, I know we elected a president, but we didn't elect these other people who perhaps are almost running the country at this point. And so the Democrats are in a total meltdown. Do we run Biden? Or do we run Kamala Harris and will that be better? And the Republicans were almost in a complete meltdown if President Trump had been killed yesterday. What would they be doing this morning? And as American citizens, we wonder and we pray and we perhaps worry for our country. But yet, as Christians, we recognize do we not that Jesus is King of Kings and Jesus is Lord of Lords today, right now, at this moment? When's the last time you read Psalm 2? I'm not going to take the time to read it all to you this morning. It's in my notes, but I'm not going to take the time to read it. But Psalm 2, it's a great psalm about the Lord and about His anointed one. That's the word Christ. About the Lord and His Christ. It talks about how the Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I will read the last verse. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry, and you perish in the way. For His wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge. Do you understand the background of that text? What's really being asked of here? The Son is being presented to us as a great king. 
And when you become when you come before a great king, what do you do? You bow. And what does he do? He extends his hand. And what do you do? You kiss it. James Montgomery Boyce, a pastor, a formidable pastor, now with sort of a previous generation. I think it's in Boyce that I read originally his comment on that verse. He said, yes, we are called to submit to Christ. Yes, we are called to kiss the hand of Christ, to acknowledge Him as our King. Yes, we are to find great comfort in this. We are to rejoice in this. And yes, when we kiss His hand, we are to see that it is nail-pierced. That changes it quite a bit, doesn't it? Nail pierce for us. And then finally, and this is sort of like the explosion on the 4th of July. This is the, the rockets going up the grand finale. Your faith and your hope are in God. In God. And can't you trust in a God revealed in this text? Who has chosen you before the foundation of the world, who has loved you by sending Christ into this world, has saved you from your sins, who says to you today, Christ rules on high, He is your Master. Every heart has a hole in it, and Christ is the only one who can fill it. Find your faith and your hope in God through Christ. What do you hope in? I hope in all sorts of stuff. Part of the reason I hope in all sorts of stuff is because I am so frail. Have you noticed the wound on the top of my head? It's mostly healed now. Man, this really was awful earlier in the week. Now, my wife has a wound on her toe. And so people all week were asking me, how did you get this wound on your head? And here is my story. I was telling people that my wife hit me with a skillet. And while I was going down, I reached in my pocket, pulled out my pocket knife, and got her on the toe. And that's not true. I won't tell you I hit my head, but man, I hit my head. I didn't see something, and I should have seen it. I'm frail. My wife yesterday went to Portland. She trusted in that vehicle to get her there. Right now, you're trusting in those blue chairs to hold you up. You're trusting, perhaps, in your job. You're trusting in various relationships, hoping that that person doesn't let you down. You're trusting in your bank account. You're trusting in your 401k or your IRA, your retirement accounts. And so long as that's all in balance, there's nothing wrong with that. Because we are dependent people. All of this reminds us of our dependence. Last week, I trusted mightily in air conditioning. We needed air conditioning last week. But of course, this passage is ending with this thought. At the end of the day, when everything else is stripped away, when everyone else has failed you, there is God through Christ who is our faith, who is our hope, and who will never forsake us. We are secure in Him. You know, I like to say there's no U-Hauls behind the hearse, and there's no air conditioning in hell. Right? It is God through Christ alone that secures us. Let's pray. Father God, I do thank you for your word. I thank you for corporate worship. I thank you for the opportunity to gather 
with believers today to worship you. And I pray, Lord, that these verses, this text, that your Holy Spirit will use it in our lives. You know each person here. You know each need here. We pray, Lord, use your word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of God. The word of God is living and powerful and active. May it do its work in us, even this day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.